Hi class, it's your Professor Joseph. Um, welcome to Hurley, uh, section 2.3. So it's we're still in chapter two um, on language, specifically meaning and definition. So this is all about semantics. Again, this is a review. What's that? We're, well, we're gonna be, you know, this whole chapter is about word meanings and definitions, you know, and what we mean when we use certain words. What this really helps with is the debates that you're viewing, you're going to get, you know, you're going to have questions on different sides of the arguments. And you might say, well, what do you mean by that word? Exactly. So this chapter is going to be um, hashing that out. Um, so, yeah, the section is called definitions and their purposes. So let's go. So, again, here's your book. Um, so right here, we'll just, we'll do, you know, this, this homework is not difficult at all. Um, so this will be a fairly quick supplemental, a little mini lecture for you, but first distinction, um, uh, definition. So we got that, um, group of words that assigns a meaning to some word or group of words. So we know what a definition is and accordingly, every definition consists of two parts. And this is the distinction I want you to get, and you can see it below here too. Um, two parts, the definindum and the definins. The definindum is the word or group of words that is supposed to be defined. And the definins is the word or group of words that does the defining. For example, in the definition tiger, and you notice he quotes, tiger means a large striped ferocious feline indigenous to the jungles of India and Asia, right? The word tiger is the definindum. It's the word being described. And everything after that is um, the definins. So again, this chart, definindum, word to be described, uses the example tiger. You can put all here, video, game, movie, anything you want, right? What words or group of words you, uh, what word or group of words you use to do the defining will be over here in the definins. Easy distinction. And what do I put here? Yeah, anyways, okay. So then in this um, section, we'll have a few types of definitions. Stipulative, this is my favorite of all. This is when you combine two words. You usually combine two words. And let me see what I put here. I will do this. You combine, yeah, let me read. Stipulated definition assigns a meaning to a word for the first time. This may involve either coining a new word or giving a new meaning to an old word. The purpose of a stipulated definition is usually to replace a more complex expression with a simpler one. You can read this below, but they'll give you an example. The word tigon was selected to name the offspring, the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion, or um, liger, lion and tiger, liger, right? Yeah, you can think of a few um, in my day. One of the first ones I ever learned was spork, a spoon and a fork. You combine the words, you get a spork. Um, I'm trying to think. I want to think students in one of my classes, I broke them up into groups and I had them think of, you know, some good stipulative definitions. And I think one, one uh, group came up with, Tindo, which is a tinted window. I thought that was funny. Um, anyways, there's a bunch you can think of. And the point is you're combining two words, okay? Um, and they give you a bunch of examples down here. Um, email, what's that? Electronic mail, um, dot com, hardware website. Some of these aren't as, you know, cool as, um, you know, other things that you can think of, but... We get the point. Oh, well, was another one? Hangry when you're hungry and angry at the same time. But yeah, anyways, when you think of words like that, those are stipulative. Done with that section. You can read through this section to get more examples. Lexical. Lexical definition is used to report the meaning that a word already has in a language. Dictionary definitions are all instances of lexical definitions. Lexical are really good because what they're doing is they're avoiding ambiguity. Ambiguity, you've already learned, is you can use, um, a word can be defined in at least two different ways. 
And in that case, it's not clear which way you mean, because there's at least two examples, right? So what a lexical definition does is it avoids ambiguity and it gives you every possible definition. You can see it a few different ways. D notice down here with light, you see one, two, three, four, right? That's four different ways you can define light. So um, when somebody uses the word light in a sentence or in a debate or an argument, whatever, right? You might run into ambiguity and say, well, hold, hold on, what do you mean by light? I can think of at least a few different ways. And then they go, oh, I mean this way. So they're gonna have to use a lexical or at least you know, break apart the ambiguity of two different possible meanings and tell you exactly what they mean. Another way to see it is not necessarily with numbers, but with semicolons, okay? So if you flip open a dictionary, you might see the word bank instead of numbers, you might say the slope, bordering a stream or river, semicolon, the inclination of an aircraft. Every time you see a semicolon right after that is a new definition, okay? So lexical, they avoid ambiguity. People use the words ambiguity and vague a lot. Sometimes they don't know what they mean. And again, in this class to the end of the semester, I'll be stressing that with you. Ambiguity, a word can be defined in at least two different ways. What do you mean? You know, which way do you mean? Vagueness, does the word actually mean what you think it means? It meaning the, the boundaries of the word you're defining um, are, are a little blurred. And we'll see that in a minute here. But anyways, lexical definition. You might say it's exhausting the ways you can define a word, okay? It's very exhaustive. And we like that because we can look in there and say, oh yeah, this is the way I wanna use the word light. So I'm gonna be very specific and use it just this way. Because if I use it in more than one way, I might run into the problem of ambiguity. Precising definitions. The purpose of a precising definition is to reduce vagueness of a word. In fact, go up here. I don't know if you can highlight in your mind tap book. Um, but give me a second. Yeah. Yes, there it is. So right there, if you're following, if you're listening, it's fine. You don't need to see this. If you're following along, I've highlighted uh, a little uh, sentence in the lexical part, avoiding ambiguity, and the precise part, avoiding vagueness, because that's the most important thing about these. Um, precising, they avoid vague terms, and they give you a lot more detail. Just think of it that way. So I'll read to you. Um, just a review, as we saw in the first section of this chapter, an expression is vague if there's a borderline case in which it's impossible to tell if the word applies or does not apply, right? It, it seems like the borders of that word, how you define it, um, are a little blurry. So precising definitions come along and say, let's make it unblurry. Let's give more details to where we definitely let you know exactly what we're talking about. Think about this in your own life. The more specific you are, the less chance of ambiguity and vagueness to your reader. You may say something and you may think your reader understands you and they don't, right? So if you give them something real vague and ambiguous, it's almost like you don't care if they get it or not, if they don't understand or not. But if you give them precising detail, it might annoy them. But you know one thing is that they really do understand better what you're trying to convey to them when you're talking with them or debating or you're reasoning, whatever you're doing, right? When you're giving them more detail, you're precising for them. So let's give you an example. Words such as fresh, rich, poor, or vague. What do you mean by poor? Do you mean like five bucks that I got in my pocket right now? Or do you mean like a hundred? Do you mean like a thousand? What do you mean? I can't tell. So then if you precise on that, you say, oh, I mean by poor, uh, less than a dollar, you know, whatever. So, um, for example, if legislation were ever introduced to give direct financial assistance to the poor, a precise definition would have to be supplied, specifying exactly who is poor and who is not, right? Otherwise, that'd be vague. The definition poor means having an income of less than 10,000 and a net worth of less than 20,000 is an example of precising. So now we've used the word poor, but it's not vague. It's very precise because you, you've been given the details down here, okay? So you can read, there's a bunch of um, examples 
of words that can be used in a vague sense down here. But I always use the same one, hot, rich, cold, poor, and you can add on more to that. And the bottom line, we want to avoid being vague. Peter Abelard, um, you don't have to read that if you want, but you can. He was a little scandalous. If you like a little drama in your life, read about him. All right, here we go. Um, theoretical definition. These are usually philosophical or scientific, okay? Hurley's going to make the argument that theoretical definitions are never 100% true or 100% false. They're theoretical. They're subject to revision. So you might say there's a lot of terms in science that we use, and you can look down here, light, force, mass, acceleration, form, you know, stuff like that. You might say these words, they're theoretical. So when you look them up, you might say, oh, yeah, I know the definition. I'm 100%. This is what it means. Well, Hurley's going to say, no, no, no. They're theoretical. If a new scientific theory comes along and sheds more light on the meaning of that specific scientific word, then it changes a little bit. Therefore, it was never 100% right or wrong. It was theoretical. In science, we use this word called verisimilitudinal. <laughs> I know it's a big word. It means as closest to the truth as you can get or closely approximate truth. So you might say, yeah, we got that down 99%. But there's a little chance for revision so we're not 100%, but we're 99 point, you know, whatever. And you might think theoretical definitions are like this. They're subject to revision. If a better scientific theory comes along and replaces it, great. Same with philosophy. So for this section, um, you know, you're given a bunch of trigger words that are highlighted. Subject, form, cause, change, idea, good, mind, God. For example, in my philosophy, or intro to philosophy class, we talk about God, mind, good, idea, change, cause, form, substance, all those. You look at those words right now and you're thinking, you, I mean, they're pretty vague. We get into very great detail, different, you know, in, in differing philosophers and different arguments about those words. And again, they're theoretical, according to Hurley, meaning they're subject to revision. You might have people disagreeing on what you mean by God or mind. Some people... Eliminative materialists will reject that you have an immaterial mind. You know, they believe that you are literally made of physical stuff and only physical stuff. So we use the word mind, but one day that'll be replaced with neuroscience, purely in mechanical, uh, biochemical terms, stuff like that. But anyways, bottom line with this, scientific and philosophical terms are theoretical. Okay. And that is... Uh, just a way of defining something in a theoretical way versus, just as a, a little review, a precising way, um, a lexical way, or a stipulative way. Persuasive. This is pretty easy. A persuasive. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote there. I lost my reading glasses this last week. All right. It fell off my car and they got ran over by another car. Isn't that crazy? So I'm waiting for my new prescription to come. So I can't even read my own damn sticky note. Great. Persuasive. Purpose of a persuasive definition is to engender a favorable or unfavorable attitude towards, toward what is denoted by the definitum. So um, this is just easy to see. When you are eliciting an emotive response to somebody, instead of engaging in pure reasoning, you're trying to elicit an emotional response. Um, you're using language that's inflected to do just that. So let me give you an example. No, we'll just read right from her. Which one of these do you think is persuasive? In other words, which one is not convey, conveying cognitive detail, like in section 2.1, where you know, cognitive, it conveys information versus emotive? It's, it's, it's eliciting an emotive response. Think of persuasive like emotive. Abortion means the ruthless murdering of innocent children. Versus abortion means a safe and established sur surgical procedure whereby a woman is relieved of an unwanted burden. Well, one might argue both are persuasive, but really the first one is, okay? And you might say that an abortion debate is so heated that even some would say the second one is persuasive, but it's really, it's just conveying information, saying, look, this is a procedure, this is what we do, okay? Instead of unwanted burden, if you want, if we wanted to tighten that up a little bit, you might say, 
um, an unborn um, fetus or something like that, or an unborn human person. But again, you start using these words, you might slide right into the very debate of being able to use those words or not. But you get my drift. This one could be touched up a little bit to where it's more cognitive, just, you know, conveys information. This one's more obvious. Liberal means a drippy-eyed do-gooder obsessed with giving away other people's money. Drippy-eyed do-gooder, I mean, really? Liberal means a genuine humanitarian committed to the goals of adequate housing and health care and equal opportunity for all of our citizens. Okay, this is very straightforward, just conveying information about the word liberal. The first one, definitely persuasive. Here's the point of all this. Somebody using a persuasive definition, they're trying to get you to believe what that word means. They don't care how you get to that conclusion. They just want you to get there. It's easier to tap into your emotions rather than have you think it through. So if you're in, if you, if you definitely hate abortion, you are definitely one way of looking at it is you could word, you know, you could define abortion like this. That means that people who read this can get emotionally charged, right? And you're trying to persuade them, but all the while you're undercutting their reasoning. Why don't you just take them to the second definition, straightforward factual details and start there. So this is where we get into huge mess during political debate. When somebody says, Hey, I have this legislative bill that's going to do this, this and that, and this is the way I define it. And then right there, right when they start, they start making fun of the opposing viewpoints or, you know, using highly emotive language to draw up the, the, um, you know, the emotions of the crowd. And some of these politicians, they don't care how you get to voting to them. They just want you to vote for them. That is when you come into this critical thinking lecture, you want to avoid doing that. If you want somebody to agree with the position you want, you want them to come there through rational thinking. You don't want them to come there through pure emotion. Why? Because pure emotion, we all have it, but it's unchecked. We can all think and feel, sorry, we can all feel and have bodily reactions physiologically to certain things that may be completely false. I'll give you an example. You may think somebody's cheating on you right now, right? And they may have told you like five or six times, no, 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 I love you. I'm not cheating on you. I've never cheated on you. And the whole time you may think that they are and you get caught in this trap of feeling and having a bodily physiological response according to these feelings. They don't even correspond to reality the right way because your lover said, I'm not cheating on you. So anyways, this, this gets into a huge debate on what role do emotions play in moral decision making, right? And I know I'm getting way off track here, but I'm just trying to tell you the danger of using pure emotion feelings when you're trying to reason about something very important. You want to avoid um, using persuasive definitions um, because they mislead people the wrong way. Like I said, they undercut the reasoning process. And last but not least, let me give you another example. Taxation means a procedure by which uh, by of which our commonwealth is preserved and sustained. Second one, taxation means the procedure used by bureaucrats to rip off the people who elected them. Which one sounded more persuasive and emotive, the first or the second? That's right, the second one did. Bureaucrats ripping off people who elected them. Okay. So obviously you're trying to steer somebody believing something about taxation when you're using the persuasive one. We'd rather use the first one. Where you're just trying to give them fact about it. Let them come to their own decisions on their own. And yeah, so there we go with that. And that's pretty much it, okay? So you have persuasive, you have theoretical, you have um, precising, lexical, and stipulative. And then, you know, the easy distinction, definitum, definitions. And that's pretty much it for this section. I think the homework should be super easy. What's the point of all this? This is just a different layer in getting you to realize what you're doing when you're talking with people using definitions and how you're using them. My goal for you is to be more precise, be more laser guided when you have to. If you're just shooting the shit, having a beer, drinking a cup of coffee with somebody, man, look, you just relax, right? <laughs> But when you get into something more serious and more debateful and more, you know, charged, 
then you're going to have to really be careful with how you define certain things. And if you don't know how to define something, simply say, I don't know. I got to think this through more. Man, that is an awesome position to have. Instead of thinking you know what you know to tell the person and you really don't know, and then they tell you that you don't know because you didn't define it a certain way or you contradict yourself. So that's the other lesson in all this is, is if you don't know how to define something, just say, I don't know. I mean, I, I forgot what that word means. And even if somebody laughs at you and say, you don't know what that means about it. No, I forgot. And be humble, right? Even if somebody makes fun of you. Point of this is your own character can stand against somebody making fun of you, even if they're wrong. Who cares? Let them blab their mouth off, right? But just think about it. And um, again, with critical thinking, we just want to, you know, use better language. And that's the whole point is. So any other questions, just let me know. Okay, thank you.